Now, dear brothers and sisters in the Dhamma, tonight Bhatti will be sharing with us on the topic, listening to and reciting the Dhamma, their spiritual significance for liberation. Venerable Professor Emeritus K.O. Dhammajyoti is a distinguished Buddhist scholar born in Malaysia, taught at the University of Kelaniya, Sri Lanka for 22 years, and later joined the University of Hong Kong, where he served until his retirement in 2015. Currently, he holds the position of Chair Professor at the School of Philosophy, Renming University of China, Director of Buddha Dharma Center of Hong Kong, and the Director of Vidya Charana Buddhist Resource in Malaysia. He has published several books, including the Sravasti Bada Abhidhamma, Abhidhamma Doctrine and the Controversy on Perception, Reading Pali Buddhist Texts, Reading Buddhist Sanskrit Texts, and numerous research papers on Buddhist studies. He's also the founding editor of the Journal of Buddhist Studies of the Center of Buddhist Studies in Sri Lanka. Let us put our palms together to invite Professor Bhante Dhammajyoti to share his Dhamma. Good evening, everybody. Yeah. I'm pleased uh, to be here again. I think this is the second time in recent years, although I'm actually, I'm from KL, I was born in KL, I'm still Malaysian, but uh, for the past many, many years, uh, I uh, have been overseas, and in recent years, mainly in Hong Kong. Hopefully, in the future, I will be more and more uh, stationed in Malaysia and Singapore. Of course, without giving up Hong Kong, yeah, where I am, I believe, doing very meaningful, important uh, works on Buddhist education, and also not just education, but the propagation of the Buddha Dharma. Yeah, we have a center called the Buddha Dharma Center of Hong Kong. You can go online. Uh, to find more information. We also have another one, as I already said, now in KL. And it is called the Vidya Charana Buddhist Resource Station at Sambutong. And for that also, you can uh, get information online. Yeah. So, uh, my hope is that Malaysian Buddhists, it's time to be serious about learning the Dhamma in a systematic way. And that's the, the purpose of setting up a Buddhist uh, study center here. But what we emphasize is not just study. Uh, our belief, our mission, right, is the integration of Buddhist study and Buddhist practice. Yeah? So, uh, Study is not for the mere sake of intellectual knowledge. And uh, as Buddhists, we should be able to put what we learn into practice. But to put what we learn into practice, it begs the question, uh, practice what? So we have to have a clear understanding of the doctrines. We simply have to put in our effort to learn. Yeah. So uh, it's because of my feeling that uh, there, there has not been a properly set, uh, set up center for systematic learning. That today we are putting in a lot of effort to set up this Vidya Charana Buddhist Resort, Ming Xing Xue Chu in Chinese. Yeah? Yesterday I gave a talk here in Mandarin and explain the uh, ideal of Buddhism, which is Ming Xing Chu, that is Vidya Charana, Sampan. That is, ultimately, we should attain the same state as a Buddha did, wherein our being and knowing become one. What we know, we act accordingly in a spontaneous way. Yeah? 
what, what we do is an expression of our inner enlightenment. This is the state of a perfect attainment of this state in the case of the Buddha. But as Buddhists, we should aspire towards that. So one part, in fact, a preliminary part only, is to begin learning the Dhamma systematically. Not just haphazardly. Yeah? And uh, the Dhamma should be your full life, whatever you are. Whether you are having a family, whether you are having a job, a career, you know, whether you are a monk or a lady. It's, it, never, it should never be a part-time work. Yeah, so you have to integrate your whole living. Right? Or integrate the Dhamma into your whole, whole living. So first step, I hope you now have the awareness at least that you need simply need to learn something rigorously huh? and work hard to understand more and more about the Dhamma. Yeah? My emphasis is that we come to higher and higher levels of appreciating, of understanding, of discerning the true message of the Buddha. Yeah? Uh, you take, for instance, the experience of uh, going for refuges. It's not just done once for all in a ceremony. A ceremony is extremely important, and we emphasize that. In Hong Kong, we have taking refuge ceremonies. Yeah? And uh, because I advocate a non-sectarian approach to the study of Buddhism. Uh, so I don't like people to try and pin me down, right? As I, this wada and that wada, you see? This yana and that yana, yeah? My love for my tradition, that is also one thing. Yeah, we, I don't need to apologize for that. But our, my approach is that my emphasis is that we need to go directly back to the Buddha to understand what he really has taught. And that is not just for, from, the, from the scriptures, not just from reading, especially, unfortunately, you people read from English or Chinese through translations. And that's why you need to study and and we got you in, in, in the reading party and Sanskrit text. Otherwise, forever you'll be just led, your nose led by these English uh, writers, yeah? using different terminologies and explaining in some time, and quite often, yeah? uh, confusing ways. Hmm? So you have to learn the languages also. Uh, so, uh, I feel that today this is the trend. People don't, don't take the Dhamma seriously. Either they think it's part-time, I'm busy, I'm a student, I'm a housewife, I am a businessman, you know. So whatever you are, first and foremost, you should feel that you are Buddhist. If you really mean it, of course. Yeah? And, uh, for my case, I always say that people understand me as a scholar, as a professor, as a writer. But they really, in a way, miss the point because I'm first and foremost a Buddhist. That's why I saw the description I was telling uh, Waitak today that, you know, in future, when they publicize me, don't emphasize too much on all the Languages I know, and these are not important, but my mission, yeah, my ideal has to be emphasized. Of course, because we are setting up academic courses, then uh, uh, is perhaps a necessary evil to also uh, introduce me yeah, as a teacher in the higher institutions. Otherwise, these are not so important, yeah. Today, I am going to share with you this topic on listening to the Dhamma and reciting the Dhamma. You can see the emphasis here. 
I said that people now, they think they don't have time, enough time to listen. If I'm free, okay, I'll come. That kind of attitude. Yeah? Uh, this is unfortunate. You have to make an effort to come. If there's a chance to listen to the Dhamma, if you think it's worthwhile, go at all costs. That is what we call commitment. And today, Malaysian and Singapore Buddhists are now lacking this commitment. It's at Hong Kong also. Yeah? So I want to emphasize the importance of listening to the Dhamma and also reciting the Dhamma. You can see that reciting, especially that word, uh, should make you realize the emphasis here. Reciting the Dhamma is uh, often taken as simply a ritualistic practice. Yesterday, I spoke about the spiritual significance of rituals. And I emphasized that. And uh, in the Malay, in, in, in the, I, I said that one of the points I made is that uh, in the English speaking sections in Malaysia and Singapore, you know, maybe in Hong Kong, other places, uh, uh, in this particular case, it's a little bit better. But in Malaysia and Singapore, you can see, it's, there's a sharp division. Those who are, those who are English educated, they go to a particular you know, uh, of course, you can't blame them because they know only English, a particular wada, yeah? and uh, holding particular attitudes. And these people, I say yesterday, are mostly very uh, ultra, the word are you, ultra rationalistic. They want to reduce the profound vision of Buddhism to the mere dimension of intellectual knowledge, understanding of logics. They love to say, Buddhism is logical. Buddhism does not require rituals. Buddhism is not a religion. I deny all this. And explain why I promote the understanding that Buddhism is a religion. And yesterday, uh, also that rituals are extremely important as spiritual practices. Of course, there's ritual in the proper sense. I don't mean irrational attachment. Yeah. Uh, I do not mean superstitions. This is not what we should encourage in Buddhism. But the fact that we are now not capable of feeling, we are not, we are not quite emotional enough as Buddhists. We are not capable of feeling and, you know, and becoming motivated in our heart through the dimension of what, for one of the, for want of a better term, religion, yeah? Uh, this is unfortunate. So it has become like this. This is a trend that I have to point out. And part of my mission is to point out the development that I see, in, especially in Malaysia and Singapore, and also in the world in general, yeah? And that's why I advocate a non sectarian approach, going back to the Buddha. Yeah, not this Vada, that Vada, not this tradition, that tradition. But at the same time, loving our traditions. Don't give up your love. Develop your love for the tradition you happen to be. There are reasons, many, many reasons why you belong to a particular uh, tradition. And you don't have to be apologetic. But what you need to do is to go beyond the prejudices and biases. Yeah, of the traditions, what you want, like you know, in the teaching of the Kalama Sutta, Buddha says, don't be overwhelmed by the authority of the tradition or of the scriptures or of the teacher. Just because my tradition says like that, this has got to be absolute truth. Just because my teacher says that it has to be absolute truth. That is not being a good Buddhist, not even as a good Theravada Buddhist. Yeah. I can say that Buddhism, from the very beginning, is critical. It's because of the critical 
uh, attitude of the Buddha that today we have Buddhism. Yeah, right? Think of the think of the time of the Buddha. He was born in a Hindu environment, Hindu culture, uh, with all kinds of expectations from society, from his royal family. He was supposed to succeed his father as the next king. Right? He was given the best of education because, because, because the uh, uh, noble tradition of theirs, right? Is to, is to produce a higher who is highly educated, especially highly educated in the in the traditional knowledges of the of the day, yeah, and who is respectable, yeah, who has powers, who has you know prestigious position in society. These are the same kind of values today, unfortunately, even among the Buddhists. In our societies, you know, you have children. What do you want your children to be? You want them to be somebody in society. What do you mean by that? Yes, got to, got to get a good job, right? And good, good salary, you know, and become respectable. These are the values. And those were the same value in the Buddha's time. And because of the critical uh, ability of the Buddha, he transcended all these. He gave up all these things. We know that, right? And he renounced the home life. He chose to be the life of basically of a beggar. So we had to learn to, to, to love the beggars, you know. <laughs> but of course, uh, uh, the Buddha is much more than just a beggar, but it is a tradition of not. Wanting anything, what you want is the true meaning of your existence as a human being. Yeah? And to, to, to have a sense of fulfillment, to, to unfold your potential as a human to the highest, to perfection. That is to say, to become a Buddha. To transcend the predicament of what is called dukkha. Yeah? Uh, in Buddhism, in Pali, we know that. This should be the values, not the values that you find in the contemporary world. You know, when I speak like this, I'm not going to be very popular. That's why I am not popular. <laughs> I've never been. But I'm concerned with the dumb, huh? to go back to the dumb. And uh, so, as I said from the beginning, in the example of the Buddha, yeah, we can see the attitude, the critical attitude of life. He rejected the caste system, he rejected all the values I've just said, yeah, and he rejected the belief in the external God, yeah, and he became a big cool, a big shoe, and he struggled. And he became a true, what we may call a true individual. Not being individualist, just simply wanting to be different from others, but a true individual who is independent of the approval of anybody else of society. That's why when he was struggling, practicing asceticism, and then after that he realized that he has gone too far. He's extreme, he followed the middle way, he was rejected. He was abandoned, forsaken, even by his last five colleagues, fellow traditioners. You know the story. Yeah, but he struggled on without any emotional support for anybody, and he finally succeeded. So we learn from his life how to be a Buddhist, what it means to be a Buddhist. Yeah. So coming back to the concern today, like, like, like yesterday, I have explained that I have cited one famous, uh, uh, very highly uh, uh, 
thought-provoking, uh, very great thinker of modern time, Eric Fromm, and explained the notion of uh, a true individual, but he calls a productive kind of personality or character type. And his notion of uh, rational religion and irrational religion, rational ritual as opposed to irrational ritual. You cannot simply white wash and say, we don't need ritual, the Buddha discouraged ritual. That's very wrong. I explained that yesterday. But these are the things you listen in, in the Malaysian society, very uncritically. Because you follow the English books. Yeah? So what the Buddha really says about ritual, does he really discourage in the sense of uh, saying that all uh, rituals and uh, rites are bad? They are obstacles for you. He doesn't mean that. He's, he's talking about the irrational religious observances of his day. Like people thinking that going to the Ganga, bathing there, right? will cleanse all your sins, so-called. And that is a way of liberation. Keeping your hairs long for your whole life, that's a way of liberation. Keeping your nails long, likewise. Learning the, 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 the manner of the cows, huh? etc. These are re irrational, mystical observances. There are certainly hindrances that the Buddha says we should not be attached to them, cling to them, quite rightly. Yeah? The Buddha does not, does not whitewash uh, in a whitewash manner, do away the importance of rituals and uh, emotions and so on. In fact, in Buddhism, now this is one. Emphasis today I want to develop now. Uh, we have to recognize that the practice Buddhism, our heart, our feelings, our emotions must be involved, must be refined. We cannot just simply get a little bit excited when you, when you hear a few words of, of, of profound exposition or emptiness or whatever. Yeah? Or of, of, of so-called dependent origination. Yeah? This excitement will go in five minutes. Yeah? Or maybe in one, 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 one month. Yeah? But for you to practice, for you to be committed to the Buddhist path, your heart must stir. The feeling must come up. You must be motivated. That's why I said, we have to be aware that we are not quite emo emotional enough in that sense. And rituals is important, even though it's not the only way, but it's a very important way to bring it out. We should not suppress the human need of expressing our emotions and the human need for religion in the sense that I have defined. Today, I don't want to Repeat everything I said yesterday. You people were not here. You didn't listen to it, but you can listen to the, uh, the uh, recorded lectures. Hmm? But some of the points I made last night is, are relevant to uh, the Dharma that I'm sharing with you today. So that's why I emphasize listening to the Dharma and reciting the Dharma. We have lost the ability to listen. We have lost the art of listening to the Dharma today. That's why there are not that many people coming up in spite of the effort of uh, <laughs> publicizing for a month, I, I was told. Yeah? People listen ca casually. But I say, you know, okay, well, if, uh, let me see whether I have time or not. If on my schedule I have to go to a party that day, sorry, I won't come to you. You, know? you want to commit, you want to make an effort. If, if you know that it's something worthwhile for you. You see? And what do I mean by having lost the art of uh, listening? Because 
I'm going to emphasize to you that listening to the Dharma in the proper way, right, should transform you. It should not just give you more information, more knowledge, but in the very process of listening, provided you have the proper mental attitude, you become transformed. Listening in the ancient time, of course, is equivalent to uh, studying today, reading books and so on. You see, in ancient time, there are no books to read. The Dharma was uh, propagated orally. Yeah, but this, but there is an advantage also, tremendous advantage compared to the way we learn the Dharma. How did the people learn? In, the, in also with in BBR in in the Buddha Dharma Center Hong Kong also, people love to ask for my permission to listen just online because it's very convenient. Right? You can have a cup of coffee and sit on the sofa, you know, and that's how you are supposed to be learning and listening to the Dharma. You won't get very much. At best, you may get some additional information. Even that information is the uh, Will not will not will not be penetrative enough. Yeah. As I say, in ancient time, the learners, i.e., the listeners, at that time we call them, right? So that's a word by Savaka. Savaka means disciple, but really it means a listener. They really literally sit near, sit near to the teacher, feel their admiration and love and respect for the teacher. Simply to want to be near the teacher. To learn, want to learn from the teacher. And then, if you listen like this, in the very process of listening, learning, you become transformed. You find true meaning in your, your life. Things that you have not thought about, that are so important for your existence, for the first time, it enters your mind. And it enters your mind in front of the teacher that you respect most, you love most. This is listening. Today, you know, people say, why so stubborn? Today we have internet, we have Zoom, you know, <laughs> and you want to reach millions of people in the world. Reverend Dhamma Jyoti, uh, you are too old fashioned. You know, because in my place, I don't allow uh, Hong Kong students and here also our local Malaysian to to uh, to have access to the teaching through Zoom. Only when the teachers are broadcasting from overseas, unfortunately, it becomes a necessary evil to do so. Yeah. So we are double middle way. We want them. If there's a teacher here, you must come and learn from the teacher. Like today, you don't wait for. No, I can wait for the recording. You know, on YouTube now, Raman Dhamma has so many talks on YouTube. You know. <laughs> <laughs> listen to them. The experience is very, very different. So I, first thing I want to emphasize, we have to uh, revive, relearn the art of listening to the Dhamma. If you want to be a good Buddhist. And reciting the Dhamma also. As I say, usually it's taken to be just a, a, a ritual. We don't do such thing. We don't need to. We are intellectuals. We are intelligent. We are clever. You know, uh, we read books. We get degrees. You know, I don't have time to recite the Heart Sutra or, or the Diamond Sutra or, you know, ATP Saw, Wanderness. Uh, People do, nowadays, speak, they are so so called pragmatic. They abuse that term, you know, abuse the concept. They think they're very pragmatic. People don't do like that, you know. But I emphasize that you should every day offer some incense to the Buddha. Offer something like flowers and water. Look at the Buddha. Bow to the Buddha. Do a little bit of chanting. Do a little bit of meditation. By the way, this is my own life. Yeah, however busy I am. 
I must confess that when I'm traveling, sometimes uh, I have some lapses. Huh? Because my mind is too occupied with uh, what I want to share, the Dhamma I want to share, and I, I mean it very seriously. I don't simply come and say something and good night and go home. Yeah? Every time I have to think what I should say and how I should say it, what I should, you know, share with you. But, uh, for example, in Hong Kong, every day, every day means no exception on Saturday and Sunday, no exception on full moon days or New Year Day. Every day, every morning, even when, when there's a storm or whatever, I'm at my center, and from 8 to 9.15, we do, we worship the Buddha, we do some chanting, and then at least one hour of meditation. Now, this is not meant for propriety, but today I'm talking about something uh, concerning uh, practice of Buddhism, right? And uh, so I just mentioned it. So everybody knows that we do this every day. This is part of our life. And uh, we, don't, we don't really publicize it. So in the morning, uh, sometimes three or four, four or five, five or six people come, that's all. Those unit students of mine, who are very sincere and they want to practice. They're not satisfied with just getting their degrees, you know, their diplomas. So they join in, but there are not many of them. Huh? In a society like Hong Kong, yeah, much more difficult, maybe in that sense, than the society in, Sing in Malaysia and Singapore. Malaysia may be a bit better because I think, uh, at least I mean in terms of the uh, living environment, because I think you people are more relaxed. Malaysia is a more spacious country and, you know, and uh, fortunately, also unfortunately, fortunately, you are not so uh, commercialized as, you know, those highly commercialized centers of living in the world. You people also, I see, are quite westernized. I am myself, to, to some extent, westernized because I lived and I learned in the West as a young man also. Huh? But, uh, but somehow the Buddhist tradition, the Chinese traditions are still thriving yeah, in one form or another. So uh, the Indian tradition also, yeah, I'm very happy. Yeah? And you have your the traditional values, you know. So, uh, one is listening to the Dhamma, the other is reciting. Both can be taken, in other words, as mere rituals. Yeah? And you argue with me with these so-called technological advances. Huh? And, uh, and then reciting also especially. Yeah? But I like to point out that if you can do recitation every day, you feel that you are being a truer and truer Buddhist and truer and truer human. You feel more, you have a better sense of fulfillment as a human as you recite the sutra. Because I'm going to tell you that reciting the sutras uh, that have inspired you is a reinforcement on your part of the experiences of inspiration that you came from the Buddha. It's only then that you I, you are able to, what I say, what I, what I call, touch your heart and improve at the emotional level. Yeah? So why do I emphasize Buddhism as a religion? Again, I'm not very popular to say like this because uh, nowadays, uh, English-speaking Buddhists want to say that uh, you know, Buddhism is just a philosophy, or just a way of life, you know, or just a, a you know, a ethical system telling you just to do good, be a nice, good gentleman or lady, you know, and no more than that. This is very unfortunate. We have not only, as I said, reduced and simplified the profundity of Buddhism, the Dhamma, we have also uh, suppressed our, our inability to, to experience as 
as a human in the true sense. We have all the capacity for love, for faith, for commitment to truth, yeah, for commitment to unfolding our potential. We are suppressing them directly, consciously or unconsciously, directly or indirectly. This is against Buddhism because Buddhism is a path that encourages you to unfold your potential as human being. Be aware of higher and higher possibilities, higher and higher states, better and better state of experience and existence. We lose all these things when we, when we become conditioned by modern Western, often modern means Western, although not always, I must say. Yeah? Uh, we have life, we have thinking. Modern Western values, this is very unfortunate. We never really get in touch with our feeling, inner feeling and emotions. And it means we are never, as I said, uh, properly human. It can be very serious. And, and that, by the way, that's why nowadays people, everybody, especially many young people, talk about their depression, you know. I mean, people feel like committing suicide. They've lost the ability for peace, for highest meaning. They, they, they feel that there's no meaning. The life is empty. Yeah. And many come into Buddhism because of that also. Yeah, well, that is not uh, something to be blamed. Only the Buddha. You 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 come on to the Buddhist path through the experience of suffering of dukkha. Yeah. So yesterday I told the audience that in the formulation of of what is called transcendental dependent origination, you see, it is dukkha that serve as the proximate cause for faith. That faith is very, very important. In the midst of your suffering, suddenly you realize that, yes, I have the ability to overcome this. I have the ability to come to a higher level, yeah, to a to mature human nature, to unfold more potential. So it's from Dukkha that so-called faith arises. Yesterday, I spent time talking about rational faith as opposed to irrational faith. As I say, I don't have time to repeat everything. So uh, this is the type of rational faith that you must develop. Yeah? In Buddhist practices, not just reading a book, listening to a talk, yeah, and uh, going for degrees even, yeah. So when you recite, the, when you listen, first of all, when you listen to the Dhamma, every time when you listen, you should feel that it is as if listening for the first time. You should feel very happy and very fortunate that you have a chance to listen to the Dhamma. Maybe it is very similar or the same wording, formulation, but they will mean something different to you. You get something new. You understand, you discern, I use the word, the Dhamma at higher level. It should be like that. Otherwise, reciting. Reciting is a reinforcement of your experience of listening. Yeah? And you feel more and more that the recitation is, should not be mechanical. Huh? But you feel, you feel more and more inspired by the same teaching. Even for instance, you recite the Ha Sutra. Yeah? I don't know how many of you, you can understand me when I talk about the Ha Sutra, Xin Jing, eh? Ha Sutra. Yeah? yeah, so when you recite every time, the same words, form is emptiness, emptiness is form, but suddenly, every now and then, you feel something deeper. And these words, at first, mean nothing to you. Something illogical. But, suddenly you feel that there's some truth. You, can't, you don't know quite exactly how to formulate your understanding. Yeah? But you, you are transported to higher levels. 
so that recitation is meditative. It's also meditation practice. It's transforming. It should be transformed. These are rituals. Uh, this can be rituals. But you should not be afraid, frightened away from rituals. Rituals are just practices. They are actions that you do. There are other actions you can do. Yeah. So uh, I think I've explained largely what is uh, the emphasis I want to make today. I'm not very familiar with this, uh, your computer. I'm going to go to the next slide. Wait, which one is it? Oh, like this, no, no, it should go automatically. Right, today, uh, to give you more concrete content of my talk, I'm making use of a doctrine called the five bases of liberation. It's a very specific uh, doctrine uh, that is found not only in the Theravada, yeah, in the Pali text we have, yeah, uh, we have several Pali texts, we have this teaching. Then you have them in the Chinese arguments, you have them in the Abhidharma text, you have them in the Mahayana scriptures. Recently, I have written one very long article, uh, something like more than 35 pages. It's there, you can see if you are interested in the latest version of our journal, yeah. Uh, with the details and all the important uh, uh, scriptural parts translated into English yeah, and discuss the importance of it. We are interested in that. But today I'm not going to repeat what I've written there, but uh, I want to emphasize the important uh, points in this doctrine. That is from the point of view of practice. Yeah. So you have this so-called five bases, the ayatana, vimukti ayatana. So we enjoy together in Pali, you become vimukta ayatana. In Sanskrit, it will be vimukti ayatana. You can still see that why there. Mm. Uh, there are five, and uh, I shall not give you only the English. As I say, all the Pali and Sanskrit and Chinese are given there, huh? if you are interested. So first is the a base, the, the base of liberation means a support basis, uh, a basis on, 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 on which, building on which, uh, something as a cause, uh, you are led to liberation, to be liberated. So that's very important because the goal of a Buddhist, the goal of Buddhist practice should ultimately be liberation. So we want to know how we can be helped, we can be led, right, to attain liberation. So you have this doctrine called the five bases. I have talked about it in various ways. You know? Last year or so, I think in at Nananda or somewhere, I have spoken in English, but from different aspects, different perspectives. Again, this is one thing I want to tell you, when you want to listen to Dhamma and to learn, to really gain benefit from listening to Dhamma. Don't have the modern attitude, you know, of, uh, you know, of uh, just uh, casually scanning, you know, just, just a title or just a few mean uh, words and say, oh, yeah, whenever Dhamma Jodi has spoken about that, I can get that talk somewhere and I'm not interested now to listen anymore. I must tell you that every time when I give a talk, you, you cannot expect and I didn't give a talk. Even my lectures. I've been teaching, for instance, Abhidhamma and Yoga Chara for many years. Every time, the same area, the same uh, syllabus, but I explain from different perspectives. And I share different additional material. Yeah. So anyway, coming back to this, uh, these five, Five bases, right? Um, 
on account of which we are helped to gain liberation. One is listening creatively. Creatively, of course, a word that I have added. Yesterday, I spoke about the productive personality, productive character type, as uh, explained by Eric Fromm, yeah? and the connection between rational faith and the productive uh, type of personality. Mm. In brief, a productive person is a person who is creative, uh, who is uh, convinced in him or in her uh, as capable of unfolding his or her potential of overcoming difficulties and and in him, there is commitment to this unfoldment, commitment to finding solutions. And Eric Fromm cites the Buddha as the exemplification of a productive person that he's talking about. So this type of personality, yeah, who really benefits from listening, reciting, and so on, uh, from these five bases. To listen, so just to 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 uh, encapsulate, yeah, this this quality of a of a productive person, productive individual, uh, the qualities. So I use the word uh, one simple word, creative. Uh, cre listen to the Dhamma, and as he's listening, he becomes, as I said, he's so inspired that he just becomes transformed. Eventually. He is a new, if you like, human, a new man. He is no more a worldling. He is liberated. So that is true, creative listening. The second one is teaching. That is very interesting. The Dhamma transforms a listener. When you learn, when you listen in that way, in a creative way, right? Provided your mental attitude is appropriate, you become transformed. But the Buddha says here that the Dhamma also can transform you, equally can transform you as a teacher. When you teach, you will teach sincerely. Yeah? And if you teach uh, out of inspiration, what you have learned, you are actually inspiring yourself and the student. And I'm going to tell you some story. Equally, the teacher is inspired. This is number two. Number three is coming to recitation. You recite the Dhamma. You're not listening. You're not uh, teaching, but you recite the Dhamma. So when you recite the Dhamma, right, again, in the, the appropriate, in the proper mental attitude, you begin to transform your recitation. Because recitation is, a, as I said, reinforcement of your experience of inspiration. But as you recite, you feel, oh, I was inspired enough to want to recite. As I recite more and more and more, I'm not just accumulating mechanistic knowledge or accumulating knowledge mechanistically. Yeah? You feel more and more inspired and you become transformed. This is number three. And then the last two, uh, pertain to the, the meditative type. You ponder over the meaning of what you have learned, you investigate them, you examine them, right? And you come to discern the Dhamma truly, the meaning of the teaching truly. And finally, the meditator, the skilled meditator, right? Through his meditation, of grasping a uh, nimitta, a medicine side, and eventually he also penetrated wisdom into that sign. So you have these five bases. Roughly speaking, you can uh, speak of five types of listener, 
What is the best way for this listener? Of course, Savaka is one listener in the literal sense. But uh, I'm thinking of a very uh, meaningful word in, in Buddhism. The word is Vinaya, V I N E Y A. Vinaya. If you know Chinese, it's so hua. So hua. That's very interesting. I talk a lot about it again today. I cannot speak in detail. Uh, in the gist, you see, when, when you, when you, when you uh, see the word Vinaya, you think of Vinaya means all the rules. Five rules, ten rules, you know, hundreds of rules, 227 rules, rule, rule, rule after rules, you know, discipline. But the true meaning of Vinaya is not that. The true meaning of Vinaya is guidance, uh, tr actually transformation, to transform you, to guide you, to guide you to a state differently from a lower state. V means different. Yeah? Ni is to guide. So it will transform you from the akusala to the kusala, yeah? from the lower to the higher. Yeah? You can even say from the mundane to the supramundane. So that's the meaning of, true meaning of Vinaya. Vinaya in the course of historical development, right, came to be emphasized as so many sets of rules. Yeah? So, Vinaya is what is called a future passive participle, right? So, Vinaya means transformation in the, in the, in the way that I've explained. So Vinaya is to be transformed the person to be transformed, the person to be guided. So, so hua is a beautiful Chinese translation. You are to be hua, you are to be transformed. Yeah, so that's the listener here that I'm talking about. So, uh, first is the listener. I don't know whether there's an English word called transform me. I, I tend to use that word. <laughs> huh? A bit rebellious sometimes. Huh? Uh, one to be like trainee and training. Huh? Uh, so to be transformed. Then the uh, the teacher, as I say, when you teach with these mental qualities, you become transformed. The third, when you recite, you reinforce the experience of inspiration, and you become transformed. Very very important. So that I hope after today's talk, you can begin to feel. That you do not apologize if you if you are interested, you know, if you practice recitation every day. You should realize the spiritual benefit you're getting from this. And you can explain why Buddhism has this practice of recitation. Why do we repeat mm -hmm. the teaching? Not for the sake of repeating, not for the sake of memory only. No. Then Fourth and fifth, obviously, it's about the meditators. Yeah? And the fourth one is the more intellectual type. Right? We, are all, we, are, we, are, we, we are all of different types, personality types. Buddhism recognizes that. Yeah? We have different uh, temperaments, different orientation. We can't deny that. This is, this is, this is uh, uh, innate with it in our genes, yeah? in our in our upbringing, yeah? So some people, they don't like uh, to do recitation, that's fine, but they are more interested, they get inspired when they meditate. Yeah, the meditative type, four than fifth. Yeah. Okay, one type is, in meditation also, there are, some are more analytical, they want to analyze and understand, the vipassana type. Yeah? And then there are some who want to unify the energies. That's a word for, for it, that's called Samadhi. Samadhi, I, I explained yesterday, does not mean just concentration. This is another unfortunate misconception in English translation. Now you should realize the word samadhi means much more than concentration. Of course, it does, it does also indicate a state of concentration. But some are dha. We think about the etymology, eh? duration. Eh? Samadha 
gives the notion of putting together fully. Yeah? That is integration, unification of your whole being. That is Samadhi. So there, there are meditators who, 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 who are skilled in this, who feel inspired in doing this. So you have the, the fifth type. So you have different uh, character types, but over uh, one general, uh, uh, you can say covering uh, description of these five types, uh, who can succeed through these five different types of so-called bases or liberation, they all belong to what Eric Fromm would call the productive type. I hope today I don't want to make it a pseudoscience eh, and uh, confine the Buddha teaching to Eric Fromm. Eh? But I think his writing is lucid and uh, uh, I think uh, uh, inspiring eh, for the Buddhist because he is, from my understanding, he seemed to be inspired by the Buddha's teaching and by the personality of the Buddha very much. It's one of those. There are others like Edwin Maslow and Rogers. And you, can, you can feel that in the psychological uh, discourses, you know, in, their, in their writings. You know. uh, there's a lot of Dhamma in, in them. Uh, Rom is maybe a bit more honest and he cites a Buddha, he cites uh, the Mininda Panna, he cites uh, Zen Buddhism you know, and so on. Huh? Mm. So uh, that brings me to one point about how we how we compare Buddhist teaching to the modern thought system. My principle is this: we should understand there's nothing wrong in understanding, in even applying modern systems of thought. We are not against it. Buddhism is not against rationalism. Buddhism is not against uh, any advance in more so-called modern knowledge. But we have to be very careful. We are easily sometimes uh, carried away and think that what the Western system says are the true Dharma. And you people are not educated, you cannot know the true Dharma. That, that's what my one of my colleagues uh, in Sri Lanka many, many years ago, he told me. He, that colleague started as a Buddhist novice, trained as a young novice. He trained, he was trained in the monastery and highly intelligent, right? Very good in English and he got a scholarship and he went to the West. I don't want to give you too much detail. And he got his PhD and he came back and he learned Western philosophy and he thinks that he understands Buddhism more correctly than his fellow Buddhist. And the way he interprets Buddhism is very, very much Westernized. That's unfortunate. That is a case of fitting Buddhism, fitting the Dhamma into the modern system. What I want to suggest to you, what I want to emphasize is to do it the other way around. By all means, learn from the West, learn from modern system, but always from the perspective of Buddhism. The Dhamma must be a starting point. Then you look at the Western system, and see whether there are any relevance in the Western system. That, that's fine then, yeah? Don't feed facts into theories, yeah? But this is unfortunately what's happening today. People talk about Buddhist psychology, Buddhist counseling, Buddhist this, Buddhist science, and all these things, you know? They, don't, they hardly know anything. No, they don't know very much about psychology. I think you and I know a bit more. <laughs> but they want to teach in the university and. Uh, they, they, they set up courses like Buddhist counseling, Buddhist uh, psychology, and so on. Yeah? Because they are mesmerized by Western thought, Western value, Western way of thinking. They want to interpret Buddhism in terms of Western thought. That is upside down. Yeah? Western thought should be understood in terms of Buddhism. That will be fine. Okay? <laughs> So when I talk about Eric Fromm, when I talk about his idea of rational religion, rational ritual, and uh, protecting, I'm using many of his terms right, only for the convenience of communicating with you. But don't go too far. Yeah. Okay. So we saw the exposition just now hmm, from the Pali Suttas, and you'll find the same 
in the Chinese Agama text, in that book, I have 35 pages. I've, I have surveyed the, the whole of Buddhist tradition as far as I can, yeah, and given you the translations. Hmm? Uh, we find this also in a text, another Pali text called the Pedagogue Padesa. Yeah, and uh, you find that later on, we'll need to know a little bit about this. Uh, just to tell you that, that, that the doctrine of the five bases are there clearly, and they are divided into, this is the part I want to tell you, but later on, I'll come back to, to uh, touch on this also in the earlier part, the earlier paragraph, the second paragraph, you see? Uh, where you see this text uh, giving a fourfold characterization of the five bases. So the five bases are correlated to four aspects. So the aspect of uh, what you have heard, what have gone through the year. Obviously, it says is the first base. We understand that it's about listening. The word of Buddha. That's that easy to, to understand. Right? Number two, he says, the text says, Dhamma familiarized through speech. And that is man to cover two. The second and third. What the second one? Second one is teaching. Third one is recitation. So you see, both teaching and recitation actually, uh, from this perspective, actually, we are under the same aspect of, uh, of, of uh, familiarizing yourself uh, with the Dhamma through words. The word you use to teach others. The word you use to teach yourself. That's recite, reciting. That's very interesting insight. Yeah? So they are put together. This is number two. Dhamma familiarized through speech. Number two, number three. Then the other two are meditations. Right? Dhamma mentally examined. That is, you can say, Roughly speaking, vipassana. That's the fourth one. And the final one is corresponding to the fifth uh, uh, base. Eh? The, the fourth category is Dhamma penetrated with insight. Of course, sorry, this is, uh, yeah, uh, depends on how you look at samatha vipassana. We are used to saying first you must have samatha, then vipassana. But we look at this. This text is a good example, or even many places in the Sutta, look at the Anguttara in the Kaya, for instance, you see. Samatha and Vipassana should not be divorced in black and white terms, yeah? as we do today in the modern world, modern movement. And then to the extent that these people are saying, ah, Samatha is no use. Yeah, you want to get the Vipassana. Okay, Samatha, 10 minutes. <laughs> and the rest of the time, you spend on uh, Vipassana. This is very unfortunate because the Buddha's teaching is not like that. This, this black and white uh, bifurcation right, of Samatha and Vipassana came a bit later in the Buddhist tradition, especially in the commentary period, in the Abhidhamma period, commentary period. And it became a standard, you see. But the uh, Savastiwa tradition remembers the, the Buddha's intention and the emphasizes very explicitly that uh, the two are not to be divorced. Where there is true samad, samatha, there is vipassana. Where there is vipassana, it necessarily presupposes samatha. Yeah? You can speak of method of a relative degree of maybe uh, specialization, uh, uh, relative degree of focus in the meditator. Yeah? That depends on your personality. Which suits you better to, to, to start to, uh, your, your, your energy are too diversified uh, and fragmented, and you want to have some experience of integration first, uh, unification, and then you go on to develop an insight. Or through developing an insight, and that of course combined with the right attitude, you know, like faith and commitment and so on, creativity, then you come to a state where your, your, your energy becomes unified. That is Samatha. Anyway, uh, I just want to point out to you from this, this, this is also a party text. Huh? Uh, you can see the way they, they, they subsume these two together, the, the base of 
preaching, teaching the others the base of reciting yourself into one, hmm? which is really suggest suggestive. Where am I now? Okay. By the way, the uh, Pedagopadesha is uh, in a way also interesting text because uh, in some Theravada branches, uh, this is not quite uh, uh, accepted as uh, as as as, as a part of the Kutaka Nikaya, but like in the said, the Burmese tradition it is. Eh? So there are controversies, and you see that some of the uh, exposition in this text are not exactly what you expect in the ordinary orthodox uh, Theravada tradition in other you know, Pali uh, text in the, in the canon. <clears throat> right, then, this text also, besides subsuming the five bases or liberation into four categories, it also explains that when you, when you develop these five bases, yeah, you are developing the threefold training of sila, samadhi, panya. Yeah, uh, this, 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 among other things, it suggests that uh, this we are looking at uh, the five bases, right? Represent an understanding that the five bases are to be practiced successively and gradually, but in the when we read the Pali Suttas, uh, the early Suttas, and uh, also in other traditions, the impression is that each and every one of the five bases itself leads to liberation. So there are different, that's why I say there are different uh, way of understanding this doctrine. But here, as I said, it, it uh, subsumes the five into three, right? Sila, Samadhi, Panya. It goes like that. This is my translation for the Pali. Uh, having listened to the successive Dhammas, when they have been well penetrated through speech, so that means one, two, three are together. Okay? First, listening, having listened. And then they are penetrated through speech. As I said, this text explained that penetrating through speech means teaching through speech and reciting through speech. So there are three. These three, in other words, uh, through these three, the prisoner comes to fulfill his ethical teaching, his sila. Yeah. And then there are two left, right? So when these words have been carefully considered, meditated upon, in other words, he comes to fulfill his samadhi. You see, I use the word equal point. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Then you, he, he fulfills his samadhi training. And I translate the word as equal points. Samadhi is much more than concentrate. Remember what I said today. Yeah. When they have been well penetrated through inside, then they come to fulfill panya, you see? So that is inside, the vipassana. So this suggests the successive, graduate, stretch attainment, right? Fulfillment of the threefold training, sila, samadhi, panya, uh, on the basis of the five bases. Let's now look at the uh, Some details, right? Just now, I have given you only a general description of the five. So we look at the first one as less especially because uh, the description in the others are very similar. So it goes like this. It says, a teacher first teaches the Dhamma to a bhikkhu. Right? So you have a teacher. Then, yata yata, ta 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 ta. In the manner the teacher teaches, the Dhamma, in that very same manner, he comes to 
directly discern the meaning and the Dhamma. So it teaches a certain Dhamma, a certain doctrine, right? So when this person, when the bhikkhu listens creatively, right, with the right attitude, that is to say, uh, he has a commitment to want to unfold his potential, to want to gain liberation, uh, and he has he has his so-called faith or rational faith again using very calm terms, right? In his in his capacity as a human being to unfold the potential, to gain insight. Listen that way, so he discerns the meaning and the dumpings. Oh yes, these words connected with teaching, particularly the teaching, right, means like this. It comes to true understanding. I use the word directly discern. Eh? I'm translating Patisangbeti from Patisangbeti. Eh? <clears throat> you see sometimes different translation, and this is my understanding. And uh, I look at all the texts available to me on this. And uh, I realize that this should be the meaning. Right? That means the word pretty some way din. So it's pretty some wit. Right? Is to know directly. And you get the, the knowledge, the understanding directly to you, not through another person, not just through the words, but you, you, are, you are directly in touch with it. So that is direct discernment. So expressed by this sutta, atta bodhisattva and dhamma bodhisattva. Yeah, uh, you might you might be led to think of the fourfold, uh, so called in, in English you should translate as special knowledges. Yeah? It doesn't mean anything but a special knowledge. But in the Pali dictionary you see this. But better still, unhindered knowledge. Yeah? The fourfold knowledge. But the, but. Uh, we realize that when you read all these different versions, eh, whether it's from Chinese, from Tibetan, from uh, uh, or Pali, or, whether, or Sanskrit, eh, uh, they, don't, they don't seem to have direct connection with that idea of the fourfold. Uh, what is a bitta I'm talking about? Huh? If you don't understand what I'm talking about, forget about it. But just uh, understand. Atta means the meaning. Dhamma means that the Dhamma. Huh? Dhamma being uh, that, 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 what, what, what are referred to, huh? the factors in the particular teaching. So it comes to direct discernment. It comes directly in touch. And if you, that discernment means a discernment that is not intellectual only, very important. Huh? It goes to the, if you like, the soul, as it were, that. It's a bad Buddhist term, huh? or the person, huh? and you feel directly touched, inspired. Huh? This is pretty something. Yeah. So then he goes and says, to a person so directly discerning, in that sense that I had described to you, what happens? He feels very joyful. Joyless arises. Is it the Pali terms here? Yeah? And being joyful. What is the next thing that happens to him in the experience? PT arises. Hmm? That is a, a rapturous joy, excited joy. From joyfulness, then you come to excited joy. And then after the excitement, the joy becomes subtle, becomes more tranquilized. It's still joy. So to him who is, has a rapturous mind, the body, not only the mind, the body, you come to total a kind of transformation of your body and mind, your, your body also transforms. Look at this. It tells us a lot about the solution, if you like, or at least inspires the solution uh, for today's problem of depression, and, you know, mental uh, imbalance. Because when your mind is joyful, uplifted, inspired, peaceful, your body also comes to be tranquilized. Yeah? And with the body tranquilized, he experiences bliss. This is the word sukha vimana. Huh? 
So uh, here I use bleach because uh, all these states are still happiness, different states, in different form, in subtler and subtler form. I leave it to you to think for a minute. What does this mean? Just try to visualize the sequence of experience. And then to him who is blissful, who is, who is experiencing sukha, his mind becomes equal point. That's samadhi. No? Samadhi in the yeah, this is uh, in the in the in the verb form. Huh? It's what is called uh, denominative. Right? It's from uh, a now, from samadhi, they make it into a verb. So samadhi, yeah. The mind becomes equal point. You know? your all your mental energies, all your psychic energies become fully unified, integrated. Then the party suttas except the uh, Petrugu Padesa, the party sutta stops here. But when you look at other versions preserved in Sanskrit and Chinese, right, it goes on from Samadhi, it goes on to knowing and seeing truly, you know, Yata, Bhutan, Pali, Pajanati. The other one pass it. This is the next step. So I put it in bracket because it's not in the Pali Sutta like this, eh? but you find them in other traditions. So from the, from from Samadhi, you go on to Yata Buddha, Yana, Dasam. And then you come to become next discontented or disillusioned. The world doesn't have magic for you anymore. All these values uh, based on craving, hatred, ignorance of the worldly people uh, do not attract you anymore. You're not interested in them anymore. So to use that word, I was thinking, what's a good word to use? The one is perhaps discontented or disillusioned. Uh, I have translated this earlier as uh, like, uh, using terms like disgusted, but then the word disgusted can be a little too heavy in a negative way. What it means is that you simply drop and function, yeah? simply give up. You don't want any more, they don't interest you anymore. You understand? So, like a child interested in toys, but when he grows up, his interest has shifted to computer. Yeah? These toys. That he that once attracted him, right, are no more attracted to him. This is the highest state of contentment. So it becomes discontented with the lower state. So it gives us discontentment. Right? And finally, you become detached and finally become liberated. So the whole thing, in other words, is a sequence. I'm only talking about one, one of the five. Right? This is in the, within the first one. Uh, to summarize, first, he listens. I would say he listens creatively. Then he becomes, uh, he comes uh, to be directly in touch of what the Buddha is teaching or the teacher is teaching. He knows in his heart, not just in his brain, not just through the computer. Uh, he knows in the heart uh, about the Buddha's teaching. He becomes completely inspired. As a result of that inspiration, he gains joy. That's very important. He becomes joyous and then the joyousness becomes excited joy and then finally tranquilized, finally bliss, and then all his energy becomes fully unified, samadhi, and then on the basis of the unification of all his fragmented energies, right, he gains insight. Knowing things through it as they are, seeing things through it as they are. And when you come to this state, a very happy, calm, peaceful state, right? An integrated, fully integrated person, right? He becomes disillusioned, discontented with mundane existence. He becomes detached. Simply, he doesn't have to force, to force and restrain himself. I, I must not be attached. I must not do like this. He naturally simply turn away from all this. And become detached and they finally liberate. So this is what's meant by a basal liberation. Yeah. 
Something for listening. Full inspiration, then a sequence of joy and higher and higher joy. Imagine that if that happens to us, every time when we listen, I'm talking about only the first phase of listening, then that listening is no more just acquiring some knowledge to pass the exam to get a great A. Yeah? You are practicing the Dhamma first of all. And you are transforming yourself. What? Even if you feel like this for five minutes, how wonderful in your whole life. Every day, five minutes become uplifted, transported to higher state of satisfaction and you know, awareness, insight, bliss. But this is what it means to listen creatively. Do you seriously think like this? Usually when you read, even if you know the party, you simply read them and say, yeah, I know all the grammars, you know. <laughs> uh, but I advocate one thing in our little centers, that is the integration of study and practice. Do not think that study is a hindrance to practice, right? They think that I practice that I don't need to study. Yeah. Do not think that your, your study is sufficient, you don't need to practice. And Buddhism is for the elite, for the intellectuals. My emphasis is that we must integrate them. We can integrate. We can, not only we must. It depends on whether you have enough mindfulness, awareness, and understanding the Dhamma. First, understanding the Dhamma deeply and bring out your, your heart, your feeling, your emotion. That is my central emphasis today. Yeah, so it, this is talking about listening. That means if you come to a course, you don't just sit there as a student with, and, and just trying to figure out how to memorize this uh, to get the, the best grade. That may be one of your requirements, but more importantly, you want to make it an experience of being inspired. You want to feel to what extent you are transformed, uplifted. So, in the midst of learning, in ancient time is listening. Eh? Now you are learning, right? In the midst of learning, you are practicing the Dhamma. In the midst of practicing, you are also learning and understand, understanding the Dhamma. That should be the ideal. Yeah. Uh, okay, so, so you can see the details of what it means. Right? Uh, to be a base or uh, to practice one base. This is only the first one. Right? Okay, to summarize, this is what's happening. Learning creatively, number one. Then you gain direct spiritual insight. So as a result of getting that, you feel joyful. Haven't you felt very happy when you understand the Dhamma? I hope today you can get some happiness. At least to some extent, yeah. Oh, I have never thought like that. It's wonderful, you know. Uh, like so, once so very often it should happen to you. Learning that way, you feel joy. The the pali words are there. I don't create them. Then from joy, then you have rapture. Rapture is kind of excited still the joy. Then you come to be tranquilize. Then you oh, sorry, this uh, spelling. Oh, come to bliss. This is kind of very refined happiness. Hmm? Dukkha is a, is a state of uh, commotion. Coming, ceasing, impermanent, you know, no stability, that's Dukkha. No harmony, yeah, disharmony, that's Dukkha. Sukha is a state of harmony, a state of integration. You feel happy, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, Pali stanza. You know, Anicca vada sankara, uh, upada vaya dhammini, pachitra nirujanti tesam upasamo sukho. When you go to a pansukula and you go to a pinara, there's humble. Chinese, do you know that? In Chinese, Zhu Xing Wu Chang. All, all, all conditioning things are impermanent. 
or they come, they go, they see Sangmi. Upachitwa Niruchanti. Having a reason, having come up, they see. They, 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 they cease, yeah? So it's a state of disharmony, commotion, lack of stability, lack of balance, lack of unification. This means that's dukkha. And then finally it says, He sang upasamo sukha. The appeasement of this commotion, this conflict, last night I talked about conflict, eh? is peace, is happiness, sukha. Is happy more literally as an adjective there. You see, you get more into this if you learn a bit of Pali and Sanskrit. Don't be frightened by them. Never too late. Professor uh, Hussein, the great Catholic father, who was the one who translated some of the most difficult Sanskrit and Chinese Buddhist text into French, the first person to do like that. Today, nobody has surpassed what he has done, actually, basically. He started learning Chinese, classical Chinese. Right? Uh, in the midst of his 40s, he started learning. You people already know some Chinese. You speak Chinese at least. Right? But he was a Belgian and from a Catholic tradition. He learned his master. And he could understand in a way sometimes better than we do in the ancient Chinese text. Anyway, so this encourages you. Learn some uh, Pali, Sanskrit is not that difficult. You don't want to be experts. You don't want to be you know, speci specialist in grammar, but you must know some basic terms. Like just now I say, when somebody uses the word uh, Samadhi, you think of concentration. Yeah? Uh, like that. Uh, uh, the word sadda is just confidence, nothing more than that. <laughs> really unfortunate. So sadda, for instance, means to place your heart into something. So it's much more, not place your computer, but your heart. Uh, it's involved your heart. Mm -hmm. So certainly confidence, oh yeah, you can have some aspect of uh, of of of, of, of uh, something beyond just a, a statistical uh, analysis of a probability and so on. But so therefore so-called trust and confidence, but it's not enough to show the involvement of our heart. So you need to translate that as faith, even though faith again is not the best word, admittedly, because you, we are using English terms, you know, and all these English terms, uh, there are no English term that is fully ideal uh, to understand Buddhism. That's why you have to learn the original word. Anyway, so from bliss, only you, your in energy can become fully integrated. That's the good point. Right? And then you, you gain insight, knowing things truly as they are, and then, then you become you let go. I say spiritually disgusted. Unfortunately, I had to add the word spiritually. But actually, I have said this discontented, this illusion. Huh? This, this is, Happily letting, letting go. Don't force yourself. You don't need to. You don't need to struggle against your, 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 your feelings, huh? uh, your view. You simply don't want them anymore. They don't mean anything to you anymore. So let them go. Huh? The becoming detached and finally liberated. This is a summary of what you have read just now, uh, which is a translation, literal translation from the Pali. So to summarize, the pupil, the listener, the learner, the student, right? He does not simply accumulate knowledge or information more and more. Through his receptivity and through his being inspired by the teacher's teaching, and that teaching, because it inspires him, he feels something, he feels something higher because what, what the teacher say, what the Buddha say, the cause is truth. Even, even though he can't figure out you know, clearly, exactly how it because it, he feels that he's inspired. So he that way he transformed. Therefore, you use the word creative. Something is creative 
<laughs> when it is when it when it when it use a completely new product. If you if your product is just a stereotype product, yeah, and simply a copy of what everybody else is doing, that is not creative, right? If you have a creative poem or a song, yeah, or novel, it means something really you have created a new creation. So that's creative. They are uplifted to higher and higher, more and more joyful level. That's what we saw just now, step by step, and that's a natural sequence. The wonderful thing. So what is what do you now understand that about the Buddhist path? It's not to make you more and more suffering. Eh? More, it, it costs you more and more suffering. But it leads you to higher and higher, happy and happier states. The Buddhist path is a path of happiness. First, you start with awareness that you are not satisfied with what's happening to you in your predicament. If you feel even frustrated, don't be afraid of that. You will feel painful. You have problems. But that's the starting point. That, that's the meaning of suffering as the near cause, proximate cause, Upanisha, huh? for faith. Then faith, faith comes up. That faith is clearly not uh, irrational belief in a person or a thing. Faith is the total human personality in you, the ability to, to trust your own inner capacity yeah, of overcoming your predicament, of finding a solution, of coming to higher states. And then not only the, the conviction, but in this way, but also conviction in, 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 uh, in the sense of Feeling truly committed, yes, I would, I can do it and I want to do it. I want to develop myself. I can develop myself as a human being. That is, that is Sadda. So from Dukkha to Sadda. Then you see the sequence from Sadda to joy and higher joy in the way that I have described to you. Uh, let me. Uh, let me see if I can find you the English uh, part of it. It doesn't matter, you know, there's a sutta called the Upanisha Sutta. Then yesterday it was in the part yesterday, yeah. Uh, it states like this, you see. So from, uh, from ignorance, uh, what's the next one? Avicca and then Sankara, right? Then Vijnana. For ignorance, conditioned by ignorance, we have all these conditioning forces. For the condition of us, we have consciousness and goes on. And finally, O, H, and death, right? This is the usual 12 link. Are you following me? So from that last link, O, H, and death, what is O, H, and death? In brief, it is Dukkha, it's suffering. And Buddha saw that in the four signs. Last night I talked about that. And then he responds to it positively, creatively. He knows, oh, finally, when he sees a monk, he knows that it's a solution. Let me leave aside the world. Let me renounce. I can do it. I will struggle. I will do it. That's what is called a productive person. That's why Eric Fromm cites the example of the Buddha to illustrate what he means by a productive personality. Who is that person? The Buddha. Uh, so, from that which and that which represents Dukkha, the next thing is Sada. And, and from Sada, you have Pamuja, joy and so on, as you have seen. I don't know why this is not, uh, I, I would have removed that. <clears throat> okay, now, let me now share with you two examples mm. that are applicable to 
the second and third base. What is the second base? Teaching, right? First, is you listen. Second one is not listening, but teaching to others. What? You have listened. Uh, you have been inspired by. You want to share with others. So when I preach, when I teach a class, I feel that I myself very much benefit. Well, it's a richest spiritual experience for me. Every time when I teach and share, I, I share from my heart. I reinforce my own faith in the Buddha, in the Dhamma, in the Sangha. Yeah? And then when I teach a similar course, yeah, like for instance, there are many suttas these days I'm teaching in Hong Kong. Yeah? These suttas I learned as a young man myself. Then every now and then, I, of course, I got caught with Abhidharma and Buddhist philosophy and Yogacara and all this, huh? uh, academic, uh, my uh, activities. I didn't have much chance to come back to the parish until recent years when I had to again teach them. But when I teach them, I share, again, suddenly I feel that my insight is that. It is much deeper. It means much more to, to me. The same thing that I have read as a young man, like say Eric Fromm's teaching, for example, uh, his uh, thought. Today I try to understand from the perspective of the Dhamma, I feel I find more meaning. I feel more directly uh, convinced of, of, of some of the teachings. So, more so in the case of the Dhamma. Yeah? So, when you repeat like this, but not in a uh, mechanistically, but with mindfulness, awareness, with feeling, with commitment, if you like, as a productive type of person, that each time a repetition is a reinforcement of my inspiration. Uh, it's liberating. So the first listening, the second one is teaching, right? And I would then add the third one also applies. But they, this example, I'm going to give it. I'm going to give two two examples. They basically uh, illustrate the second one. That's teaching. How a person can be transformed in the course of teaching, preaching. But I would say that these examples also apply to the third. Wait, what's the third thing? Recitation. Because reciting is we have seen the Pitaka Patesha puts it quite well. Huh? Actually, they both belong the same dimension of Memorizing ourselves, yeah, through speech. You teach through speech. You recite through speech. You become more and more reinforced, more, and more familiarized with the, the Buddha teaching. Yeah. So anyway, uh, it, 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 it more directly, of course, uh, illustrates the second one teaching. So. I say two stories. One is from the Pali source. Another one is from the Sanskrit source. So in the Pali source, uh, we go to the Milinda Panna, you know, very inspiring book. Then we see this monk called Nagasen, you know, very, very brilliant monk, inspiring monk. But at that time he was young. At the time when he was young, huh? So, uh, once an uh, old lady, Opasika, yeah, old devotee, came to offer dana to him. Yeah, in the in the tradition, the Theravada tradition, you can say, uh, uh, when a monk offer, uh, accepts dana, then usually he, he preaches to the devotee. He makes the devotee happy and rejoice in the merit of giving, and inspires him or her. Yeah, and that that is the kind of thanksgiving eh? I call anumodana. Anumodana is like rejoicing in a good act of giving by the devotee. So it uh, is done. It, it is a very very meaningful practice in in, in, in Theravada tradition. I must say that. Eh? Usually in Chinese tradition, you know, you spend some money or you get from the Chinese restaurant and <laughs> you give it and Finished, and one ang pao at the end, you know. No, but in the tradition, it's not like that, you know. When you when you give, when you do something 
uh, meaningful like this, especially meaningful, the monk points out to you the benefits in terms of spiritual practice. He preaches to the preaching is very, very important. Of course, in some tradition, maybe sometimes you can see, like say, maybe in the Thai tradition, there's still a lot of chanting. That's sometimes influenced by the Chinese tradition. Right? But let's say in the Sri Lankan tradition, the main part is not in the chanting. The main part is in the preaching, in every ceremony. And I want to uh, introduce that system in Hong Kong. For every festival and celebration, like whether it's Vesak or Katina and so on, eh? I make sure that preaching by myself and others, especially I do myself, eh, is the main part. And they know they come here not to mechanistically be, I'm a good devotee. Oh, today is Vesak. A Buddhist is supposed to go to temple. Buddhist is supposed to do this, supposed to give lunch. Yeah? Who stop? They're happy enough just doing that. But I want to make them understand that it's an occasion for you to practice Dhamma, listen to Dhamma, be inspired by Dhamma, learn something about the Dhamma. You see? So we preach. Huh? So, like that. So, uh, that old lady says to that Nagasana, yeah, Nagasana. I'm old. That's an old lady. It seems a very sincere old lady. I'm old. Please give me a profound Anumodam, uh, Thanksgiving sermon, whatever. In the form of profound Dhamma, uh, is Gambiraya Dhamma Kataya. Okay, in student case. Hmm? Gambira means profound. Very deep Dhamma. I want deep Dhamma. Please give me. Don't just say, do no, do no evil, do all good. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you can see what I say is existential. She is existentially angry. She knows it. She said, I'm, oh, I want to learn about the truth as a Buddhist. I want to learn about them that I can practice that's meaningful for my existence. So what happens? Then Nagasana preach. Yeah? So at the end of that preaching, I use the word of Professor Rich Davis. Eh? Uh, the English translation, he said, he felt the force, he felt the force of the truth he himself had preached. And he too, who? The preacher too, the teacher too, Ayin Nagasana, he too arrived at insight, reflecting on the Dhamma preached by himself. This is the power of teaching, not as a job. Yeah, not as a duty. Oh, I'm supposed to preach when somebody gives me something. No, it's not like that. He 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 is, he was teaching from his heart, with his whole soul, as it were, and he began transformed. He was inspired. Oh, I'm talking about what the Buddha. I'm teaching what the Buddha. I have known this teaching eh, many times from the scriptures. So when you express this. Communicate this truth sincerely, deeply. That teaching of truth means so much more to you and it can transform you. And this is what happens to that uh, Nagasana as the preacher, as a teacher. This, this uh, is an example of that second base uh, teaching. Another example I take from the Northern Source. Uh, this is about another very important Buddhist leader, hmm? brilliant and uh, uh, very successful leader. Uh, his name is Upakukta. Yeah. So uh, in his time, there was a, a, a beautiful and famous courtesan, uh, like a kind of a high class prostitute, and her name is. That's her name. Yeah? And uh, she was passionately attached to that, that monk. The monk, of course, was a good monk. Right? He didn't care and she tried to send messages to him, beg him to come and see her. And she rejected all this. Yeah? And to cut the story short, this lady, beautiful lady, right? got caught uh, in a, a dispute uh, uh, with involving two factions. Mm -hmm. 
and she came to be dismembered. That is, her, her limbs and her legs were cut off. And she was dying. Yeah? So because of a certain affair. Yeah? And then a uh, message was sent to Uvagupta. Huh? Again. And she was begging Uvagupta to see. We had never seen her. Yeah? And uh, then Uvagupta then thought, yeah, now it's time for me to see her, to, to enlighten her, to help her. And Uvagupta said, previously, she wished to see me for sensuous reason. That's why I rejected. But now her limbs are cut off. The sunshine wedding are a bit long, so I believe that. Her limbs are cut off. It's time now for me to see her. To guide her spiritually. So he went. Then he told the lady, the condition, I have not come to see you impelled by my desire. That's not the reason for me to come and see you. Right? But to see the intrinsic nature of desires and impurity. I have come to myself gain insight. The nature of desire, the nature of impurities. Yeah? This are integral part of your intuition nature. I want to feel it directly. To get inside into this. So I come to see you. So he goes on to uh, preach to her and then there's a beautiful stanza that I just quote just one part of it. The stanza says like that. Seeing form, that physical form, right? Beautiful on the outside, a fool is attracted to them. So you see a Evil lady or something huh? like this, you get attracted out of out of sensual desire, knowing them as corrupt on the inside. So what is that? That form, that physical body, physical body, it's just impurities, right? You know, we have meditation called the asuba, hmm? meditation on impurities. Hmm? So knowing them as corrupt on the on the inside, a steady man remains indifferent. He's not. He's not. Attracted by that, that beauty huh, of the lady. When this lady, Asavatapta, when she was listening like this, she felt humbled. Earlier, even up to the state when, it, when it was, she was driving, dying, all, all that happened was that she was still being impelled by desire huh? to want to. Uh, uh, Win the, the love, the attention of the handsome mom, huh? Obakopta. So now she feels humble. She knew a very foolish existence she had there with all the upside down uh, <clears throat> thoughts, hmm? mentality. So humble, recollecting the Buddha's virtue. He, 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 he thinks of, he contrasts. The Buddha's perfect peace, equipoise, compassion. Yeah? He recollect the Buddha's virtue and he asked uh, Vokuta, not please look at me, please have love for me, not like that. We request her to preach to, request him to preach to her the words of the Buddha. He wants a preaching of the Buddha. Yeah, maybe for the first time. She had ne earlier she had never felt like wanting to listen to the, the Buddha's word. Huh? Then Upakupta, that monk, the handsome monk, the intelligent monk, right, preached her the graduate equation one by one. That, that means uh, starting from Dana, you know, and then Sila and so on. Coming hmm? I mean, to an understanding of so slowly. He, a gradual discourse, in step by step, huh? and uh, then he comes to that part about understanding intricate nature of a body. We attach the body, we see beauty in the body. Yeah. And uh, what is the true nature of the body? It's impermanent. Yeah. It's uh, decaying, mm, and so on. So he himself became disgusted. 
as he was preaching, he himself became disgusted. There's no more just preaching out of duty as a monk, repeating the, the textbooks in the in the monastery, yeah, for teaching or preaching. No. He really feel the teaching, feel the Dhamma, his heart is touched. He became disgusted and he gained direct insight. There were the other things. That is direct realization, not just not just uh, intellectual understanding. So that means, I have to give you an example. Now, when you say, when you hear, listen to the teaching, when you read the books and listen to say, our preaching, you know what it means uh, when, when, when the word, the truth of suffering, the first of the four noble truths, or the four noble truths themselves. Huh? You know the words and you feel that you understand. Yeah? That the intellectual understanding. And maybe a little bit of a feeling. Uh, is arousing you hmm? in a spiritual way, but basically it's intellectual, conceptual. It's what you gain from the book, from the Buddha's word and so on. But one day when you practice the Dhamma, you yourself become truly transformed. You see in the meditation, ha, huh, now I know what I have heard all along from the teachers. Yeah, from the Buddha. That way actually is similar. It says that no teacher, no teaching, and no no listening, no teaching, but he recites what he has learned. Yeah? And in the manner that he is reciting, yeah, the very same manner, at the very time, he becomes inspired, he is touched directly. And from that, what is the next thing? There's joy. Joy becomes greater joy. Greater rapture, rapturous joy. And then the joy becomes uh, subtle and subtle, yeah. And if he experiences tranquility, universal energy, and insight finally liberated, okay. This is the third way. So, this uh, I've already explained to you. The reciting is effectively actually reciting is reciting, is learning come teaching. That's reciting, right. You teach yourself, however, huh? even though nobody listens to you, you teach yourself again what you have learned. Hmm? So, in this sense, the, the examples are giving you about Nagasena and Nirvana actually apply to that third base of re reciting also. So, this is the, we have seen the, the third base. Huh? Finally, I think it's getting a bit late. So I want to show you that the whole emphasis is on listening them. Everything starts with listening. It means that the deep desire, sincerity, commitment to want to learn the Dhamma. And today, I hope you realize it's very important to reacquire that art of listening to the Dhamma. And feel happy when you listen. Hmm? When you read, that is a form of li listening. When you share the Dhamma with others, that is also a form of listening. Hmm? And uh, finally, I want to tell you that this emphasis on, on the five uh, bases of liberation, particularly the emphasis on the need to listen to the Dhamma. Without listening to Dhamma, you can again a liberating wisdom thought in the Dhamma. This emphasis is seen even in the Mahayana text, for instance. But it's not just for Theravada Buddhism or Pali Buddhism or Abhidharma. You find the same emphasis. Right? In, my, in my long article, I have shown you that. Uh, Mahayana traditions and uh, Yogacara texts on the five bases. Here I want to cite a sutra, and that I think you have at least heard of it. It's called Avatan Sakha. Hua Yan Jing, Shi Di Pi, Shi Di Jing. How you see the emphasis that everything starts with the desire, sincerity to 
to listen to the Dhamma. We don't listen to the Dhamma. You, no use talking about the profound wisdom of emptiness, of non-activity. These are philosophically very profound, but profound as they are philosophically, do they touch your heart? Do they transform you? If you know what Emptiness means right here. When you go out of this room, you're the same person. Everything is not empty anymore. <laughs> We're empty in the lecture room. <laughs> so, uh, no. So, everything goes back. This sutra says that even the profound liberation that is based on profound wisdom uh, must be derived from listening to the Dhamma. So it says like this, I have already, because it's a bit long, so I have, uh, in, in the article, I have shown you the, the actual text. Huh? Here I just summarize. Huh? So it says like this, it occurred in the sutra. What is the sutra? The sutra is a Mahayana sutra. It occurs thus to the Bodhisattva, fervently desiring to uplift sending being. Right? The Bodhisattva mission is to uplift sending beings from suffering and establish them in nirvana. Then in his reflection, the Buddha realizes that to uplift sending being, uh, you need the profound knowledge or the unhindered knowledge or emancipation. This is just a technical term. Uh. So he says, he thinks, he understands this is not possible other than abiding in that knowledge, unhindered knowledge, complete knowledge. Mm -hmm. And this in turn is not possible, right? impossible other than the true awakening. You have to have true awakening into all dharmas. You understand all the factors of existence right? in order to gain, to gain that, that wisdom Call unhindered knowledge. And this through awakening is not possible other than wisdom causing a non occurrence and non arising, in other words, emptiness. Wisdom causing emptiness. Yeah, this is very profound. But this wisdom is not possible other than meditative reflection based on skilled meditation. And finally, this is not possible, or that is not possible. Without skillfulness in listening, he realizes that I must develop my skillfulness and listening. I have never been listening properly. Yeah. Then, having understood through such a reflective consideration, he day and night strives vigorously for just one thing. All he wants is only one thing: to listen to them. He will sacrifice everything but just simply want to listen to them. So, talking about it, profound knowledge of emptiness, of no activities, no, so on and so on. Talking about the great uh, ideal of saving all sentient beings, but to begin with, I must listen to the Dhamma. Without that as a starting point, I can't practice as a Bodhisattva. I can't gain the wisdom to be able to liberate all sending beings. Yeah. So it shows that the emphasis on listening. Yeah. Of course, you see, it's not that this Buddhist has not studied all the doctrines, but studying is one thing. The really, when you feel there's a teacher who can inspire you, yeah, who really knows the Dhamma, you simply want to listen to have a direct dynamic spiritual relationship with that teacher in the act of listening. Yeah. That's important. Only then you can talk about other steps. Right? Finally, uh, liberation and attaining nirvana, salvation for oneself and others. Okay. Uh, so I just uh, have a summary here. Therefore, the process of liberation starts with what? 
receptive listening. Remember that. And that brings about, because that brings about a, 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 trans a, a transformation, a fundamental transformation in the listener, in the trainee, in the Vinaya at that time I introduced you, right? And uh, making, uh, making the person attain unexperienced states. That have, the states that, have, that he has never attained before. That means that he's really nearer, it's truer to his true human nature suddenly is uplifted to a domain uh, where he has never been uh, of higher truth, of higher happiness, higher meaning. And that's what I call religion or the religion, religious domain. Mm -hmm. So eventually a new man is produced. I mean, he's transformed. He's, that's why the process is said to be creative. One which what is a new man? Person who is truly liberated into a state of perfect harmony, perfect spiritual security. But for this creative listening to be truly transformed, there are certain premises. I didn't have time to talk about it. Huh? I wanted to put you in in, in that in that uh, article. I have I have discussed of premises. So one is. You must have a direct dynamic spiritual relationship with the teacher. The Sutta, for instance, the Panyasuda says that the pupil, when he had decided that he is my teacher, he lives with that teacher. Yeah. Not flying once a year in a summer holiday, you know, and to meet him, not like that. He lives with the teacher. So in that way, he has a direct relationship with the teacher. And then when he leaves the teacher, he serves the teacher. He feels happy that he has a chance to serve the teacher. That is a very important aspect. And he serves with sincerity, with respect, with affection, with love for the teacher. Yeah. And so his mind becomes completely receptive and tuned into the spirituality, if you like, of the teacher. And also he has uh, other qualities like, like the quality of shamefulness. That means that my teacher has these qualities, maybe it's compassion, maybe it's uh, wisdom, I don't have. Yeah? And a deep quest for commitment for truth. So these are the prerequisites. So these prerequisites have to be fulfilled and only, again, using Eric Fromm's term, a productive type of personality can be in possession of this quality. Then such a person listens to the Dhamma, becomes transformed by the Dhamma. Yeah. So uh, in any form's term, using this terminology, it means that only a productive type of person like the Buddha huh? himself, before he was a Buddha, huh? can be endowed with what a rational faith. Huh? A person endowed with, a pretty person endowed with rational faith. Uh, please refer to my talk last night. Huh? Maybe one more detail. It's worthy of being a Vinaya. This is the term I introduced you just now. A transformee or a transformable. You, are, you and I are Vinaya. Huh? Hopefully, we are worthy. Yeah? The doctrine also shows that even the fulfillment of all the premises I've just discussed a minute ago, uh, the process of transformation is a very natural progression from greater and greater subtle and subtle joy. We have seen that. Once we're being transformed, You are blessed with happiness. Eh? Profounder and profound forms of happiness. Hmm? Personal direct discernment of the Dhammas. That is, Patisangvedi, that being Patisangvedi, eh? thought eh? and the meaning necessary, in other words, leads to joy and then to rapture and then to other higher states and then to serenity then to unification of 
psychospiritual energies, and then finally, primitive action. In brief, the center basis of all Buddhist scriptures that stands out is this. Huh? The possibility of final liberation begins with the awareness of and the listening to the Dhamma. This is the topic today. There's a starting point. We must be aware that there is the Dhamma. The Dhamma offers the solution to the human predicament. The awareness. And then, what is that Dhamma you want to learn? You want to learn in order to transform yourself, to up yourself and all other beings. Even the, we have just seen the profound wisdom of emptiness, non-arising, and expounded in the Mahana text, right? such as Hathasaka, must be preceded by this listening to the Dhamma. So this is a consistent emphasis throughout this tradition, throughout the whole Buddhist tradition. Call it Theravada, call it Mahayana, call it Abhidharma. So we have to bear this point in mind as modern followers of the Buddha and expect of spiritual practice that we have neglected so much. Today we have to be aware of the importance of listening to them and how to listen to them in a manner that he can be transformed and he can transform others. Okay, I think should be the end this half an hour time. <clears throat>